no. But many thought that that medieval time, uh, that life wouldn't change. The only change we could look to was uh, eventually, hopefully, going to heaven, uh, avoiding going to hell, and, and that was kind of the end of it. But now, by the time of the Renaissance, people start to see that the, that the world can change. It can shift. It can become different. It's not this sort of steady thing, and we're all just waiting around to either go to heaven or hell. Okay. But we know we know the Renaissance. We know Renaissance thought, and how that translates into kind of our modern temperament. Uh, the Protestant Reformation. This is a very important uh, movement as well in Western thought and Western thinking. And though it has to do with religion, it's uh, the like the political ramifications of it are important too, because um, a it sort of breaks up the Catholic Church as the sole authority in Europe. There was a sole authority of truth, and that is the Bible. And not only was it the Bible, it was the Bible as, interpret as interpreted by the clergy and by the Catholic Church. With Luther, Martin Luther said, anyone should be able to read the Bible. We should be able to print the Bible in, something, in languages other than Latin. People should be able to read it and interpret it for themselves. And this is very radical because it says that human beings can actually you know, find out the truths of religion by themselves. They don't need the clergy, they don't need the sacraments, they don't need um, you know, the pope, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really important, especially when you consider uh, the challenge to authority that presents. Because it's a challenge to spiritual authority, but people also start to think, maybe I can uh, learn the truth behind uh, political life, other truths outside of the church's teaching. If you remember, we said um, that kind of the influence of Plato uh, at the end of uh, my previous lecture it was that um, people believe that kind of revealed religion could serve to help us find out the absolute <coughs> truths behind behind uh, life that we could learn moral standards through revealed religion. It's that uh, Jerusalem part of Athens versus Jerusalem. That's kind of a long time ago, but anyway. Um, people began to think, well, maybe Jerusalem doesn't stand up at all, and maybe we can find truths in some other way. And it began again with the religion and the Protestant Reformation, but the scientific revolution is also extremely important. And that comes again in you know, the 15 and 1600s, the work of Copernicus and Galileo, and again, it's not necessarily their scientific discoveries, as important as they were, but it's what they meant. Because when people start to find out, oh, man isn't the center of the universe, and Earth isn't the center of the solar system, that we're actually revolving around something else, maybe we're not as important as we think we are. Maybe the entire universe wasn't set up so God could prove some great plan invol involving humanity. And. They did help to challenge church authority. Again, we're seeing through this entire trend a challenge to traditional authority, more individualism. But the teachings of uh, Copernicus and Galileo, especially of Newton, Newton becomes probably the most important scientist who has, I would say, pol uh, you know, political ramifications or philosophical ramifications, because he, in his physics he says that the world is is um, created according to certain fundamental unchanging laws. And we've discussed natural law in here before, what's natural, but Newton proved that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Well, why shouldn't these repeatable laws be true for things beyond the physical world? Why shouldn't they apply to the modern world? Or the modern, why shouldn't they apply to the social world? Why shouldn't politics and society be governed by these rational and reasonable laws? Why can't we perfect our society using these science like this? Okay. <clears throat> okay. One other thing I want to get to on the scientific revolution, though, is that it came about, I can't remember if I had this on another slide or not, but it came about with, oh yeah, never mind, I'll get to that next. Okay. Um, we discussed uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke in class, and uh, just, uh, they were the originators of social contract theory. Dr. Babby went through how they were both the intellectual descendants of Machiavelli. However, in their thought and in their thinking, they didn't begin with 
they separated themselves from other thinkers by, by they didn't begin with religion. They didn't say, we're going to understand human nature by uh, thinking, of, let's go back to the Garden of Eden and how did Cain and Abel handle this and yada, 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 and that's how we're going to find our truths about human nature. They came up with something different. They thought in both of their works, in uh, Leviathan and then in the Second Treatise on Government, they both sat down and said, we want to learn about human nature. Let's set up, let's think of the state of nature. Let's think of human beings before there's any government, before there's any society, before there's any law. And as we know, Hobbes' state of nature was really violent, and government was necessary to keep people from killing each other. And in Locke's state of nature, things were a little better, but still we needed government to preserve inalienable rights. Remember, the rights to life, liberty, and property that Thomas Jefferson quoted in the Declaration of Independence. So again, they're trying to approach, when they're discussing, you know, how does human nature work, how does politics work, they're, they're doing it from a sort of scientific manner. They want to set up a state of nature. They want to take this logically. They want to just think back and come up with it. They don't need to look to religion. Though both of these authors do use quotes from the Bible, they're in more of a cursory way because if you didn't kind of quote the Bible back then, you could get in trouble <laughs> with, a lot of, with a lot of these works. But uh, very much men uh, uh, ahead of their time in that regard. Okay. Uh, Locke especially, I point to Locke because he's going to be rather important. He represents what we call the Enlightenment climate of opinion. And these uh, trends that we just discussed with Machiavelli and the Renaissance, and the uh, Protestant Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, all lead to an era in European history that we call the Enlightenment, or the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment, there we go. And this is broadly a period of time from the middle 1600s to the end of the 1700s, from uh, you know, the, about ends in probably the, uh, the, with the end of the, or the beginning of the French Revolution. But it's this age of enlightenment. It's this time of skepticism. It's this time of um, challenging, especially the church, challenging society, and trying to change things and trying to change a society into something new and different based on reason and rationality, not based on God, not based on superstition, not based on... on uh, people's quaint beliefs, but based on something bigger. If we know that the world works according to scientific law, then why don't we craft a society that's governed by similar laws, by reason? So, the Age of Enlightenment was typified, as I said, by a greater skepticism of religion. Now, especially, okay. okay. What did you say it was based on? Uh, reason and rationality, which are kind of the same thing. But those are two words that get used around a lot. Because though there is an abandonment during this age of enlightenment of religion and traditional religion and traditional authority, it's almost replaced by a faith in human reason. The faith in human beings to be able to improve themselves using their intellect. It's almost like Machiavelli, that people should be able to pursue their own self-interest and we'll all be better off. This is kind of an extension of that. Okay. So again, there's greater skepticism of religion. Right. Would the American Revolution be part of this? Yes, very, very much so. And that'll come up when we discuss about classical liberalism, which is kind of the main iteration of Enlightenment thought. But that we get the American Revolution, we get revolutions throughout Europe, the French Revolution, all kind of have their basis in these tenets of Enlightenment thought. And we're going to get to them. So the Enlightenment thinkers, and I'm being, I need to say, I'm being very general here. I'm going to say things like the Enlightenment philosophers, or the Enlightenment thinkers, or uh, the socialists, or something like that. And I'm being very general just because we don't have time to go into anyone. Now, there was a lot of difference here, a lot of nuance, but I'm trying to be as broad as I can and try and paint for you a, an idea of a, of a whole climate of opinion, and kind of the general view that the Enlightenment thinkers had. Uh, they didn't think of, they didn't somewhat think of religion, but God wasn't intervening in everyday life. 
He wasn't the Christian God. They thought of a God who was a mechanic, an organizer, the creator, the, the clockmaker God. And God basically made the clock and wound it up and it would work according to rational, natural laws. And he just wound it and it's up to us to organize the world according to his laws. So it's not the God that you know intervenes in everything and if you throw a ball up in the air, God could stop it if he wanted to. No, that ball's always going to come down because of Newton's gravity. So hopefully we can kind of understand this too. Again, the Enlightenment was created with rational laws in mind. These repeatable laws apply to more than just the world. One the natural world. And one thing that Newton did that was so important for the Enlightenment is by sitting down and coming up with things like gravity or coming up with things like physics and thermodynamics. You can see that everything, every phenomenon in the world applies to everyone equally. It doesn't matter if you're the Pope or the King or the you know poorest dirt shoveler in France. You can the laws of physics apply to you just the same. So God, rather than what we were taught, doesn't favor any one people, any one person or group of people or the clergy. Everything acts according to everyone the same. You know, if you fall off a cliff, it doesn't matter if you're the king or a president, you're going to die, probably. <laughs> so it proves that we have more of a democratic universe in that the phenomenon of the world apply to us equally. And again, the Enlightenment thinkers took this idea and applied it to governments. They applied it to civil societies. Say, well, civil laws, positive laws, should apply to us equally as well. <clears throat> this is all kind of going into this pretty quick, so I'm kind of repeating myself a bit, but you kind of understand, hope you kind of understand how this is going. Um, natural rights were a major part of the universe. Now we've discussed the role of nature and going all the way back to the Plato, um, the Plato unit, and you know what is natural, what are the laws of nature, etc. But the Enlightenment thinkers believed that there were laws of nature and that translated into rights. And so in the Declaration of Independence, we have we hold these or these. Um, Truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Inalienable rights endowed by the creator. Locke says we have the right to life, liberty, and estate, or life, liberty, and property. Now he doesn't say because it's in the Bible, he says it's endowed by the creator, or it is. Locke actually says because we are all creations of this great benevolent God, we all should have the same rights and among these life, liberty, etc. So a major part of Enlightenment thinking is that these natural rights, which are different from previous natural rights thinking, I think I discussed a little bit in my last lecture, they don't necessarily come directly from revealed religion or the Bible, but they come from, if we think logically about the world, we can arrive at them. That's basically it. I mean, it's kind of... They don't really give a source for it. Again, it's this faith in human reason to, to solve these problems, to come up with what natural rights are, to come up with the ways to defend them, etc. Here I put up some Enlightenment thinkers on the board just to get some more pictures on here, since I don't have any pictures in this one. Uh, David Hume, Scottish philosopher. Edward Gibbon, an uh, English historian who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, Montesquieu is a political scientist. Actually, our Constitution is probably based more on Montesquieu than anyone else. Adam Smith, the famous economist. Rousseau, political philosopher. Voltaire. You probably might have at least seen these people or read something. Probably a lot of you will have to read Candide by Voltaire at some point. But anyway, all these people sort of challenged their own societies. They saw flaws in their own society, but they had faith in the power of their own reason to come up with a new and better society to improve man, et cetera, et cetera. So these are really kind of the first thinkers who want to go out and change stuff. <laughs> like we think uh, ac academics or, you know, we, if we have uh, intellectual pretensions, we think we're going to go out there and change the world. Well, these guys are kind of the first ones who wanted to because they weren't saddled 
by the traditional authority of the church and religion. Though some of them did get in major trouble, some of them were were censored and run out of places, etc. <clears throat> okay. Okay. As far as the view of history in the Enlightenment. In general, they viewed that, that the Greeks and Romans had achieved this golden age. They looked back with fondness. Remember in the Enlightenment and how Machiavelli does too, or in the, the uh, Renaissance and how Machiavelli looks back at the Romans and says, man, those people were so great. Well, it's the same here. The, they looked back at the Greeks and Romans and they saw people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and they saw oh, Julius Caesar and Cicero and all these great figures and were like, man, that was... That was really a good time. Those people knew what they were about. They followed reason. They were free, as long as they weren't slaves. <laughs> they were free. They had good civic virtue. They weren't saddled by uh, superstition and the hocus pocus of, of religion. And they kind of thought that this golden age had been subverted. It had been undermined by the advancement of Christian religion. And that's basically the thesis of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It says the Roman Empire was doing pretty pretty damn well, and then all of a sudden they all convert to Christianity and they lose their masculine sort of civic virtue and they become, you know, for all intents and purposes, wimpy and they get beat by the barbarians. I mean, you can look at it, it's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's, it's again this challenge to religion, etc. <laughs> so they kind of viewed the last 2,000 years, or the last, you know, 1,500 years of history as being kind of a waste of time. But they did see that in their own age, they were returning to this sort of civic virtue, these great ideas that the, um, that the uh, ancients had. Uh, like I said, they wanted to change their society, and they did want to, um, to uh, base a new society on reason and rationality. Now, they really couldn't define what reason was, and I don't know if we can, because if we look at things like if I say, well, we're going to go about this reasonably or rationally, what does that mean? What's the source of that? And they don't, they kind of come up with the same problem. If you're going to base a society on reason, that's more of a tool. That's more of, you know, logic is a tool. It's not a, a it's not, you know, written in a book somewhere. So it came to be, they started to justify lots of different things and call it science. <laughs> and so, you know, it's scientific that, uh, that, um, the Christian religion subverted the Roman Empire, something like that. We get to this problem with, as we come up to Marx. You'll see when we read Marx, the, even like several hundred years after this, he's writing about dialectical materialism, and he says, oh, if you look at my plan of history, it's inevitable that communism will rule. It's scientific. Communism is scientific. Well, everything else is based on stupid crackpot ideas that, that uh, don't matter. Oh, let's see. Primary political philosophy of the Enlightenment is what we would call classical liberalism. Now, there was a mention early on about what, where we're going to study classical liberalism. This is about as close as we're going to get. But this derives mainly from the thinking of Locke. It's an ideology that is still with us today. We can, um, anyone who's probably a member of a democratic society would would be considered a liberal in this sense. Uh, it me doesn't mean the same thing as modern liberalism. So, uh, you know, liberal and conservative both mean very different things. Indeed, there were many ancient, or many classical liberals who would be considered conservatives uh, today. But the tenets of classical liberalism are like Locke said. It believes that the greatest good comes from a maximum amount of human liberty. And that's liberty to pursue one, to live, to think how one wants, to worship how one wants, and to make money how one wants, or to live their life as one wants. Um, again, incorporating locks and alienable rights of life, liberty, and property, or the pursuit of happiness. Um, Adam Smith is a big thinker in this. And one of the most important points of this early classical liberalism is that the only, or the major source of repression and the major hindrance to liberty is government. It's not economic forces, it's not religion driven. It's when religion is tied to government, yes, but it's not anything other. Government is what we have to worry about. The free market 
should be there. That, like the free market is an essential part of classical liberalism. We have to be allowed to make money in the most, in the freest, best way we can. And as I said, Adam Smith, who many of you probably heard at least his thesis in the Wealth of Nations, argues that people pursuing their own self-interest all together will make things better. It will make uh, society work, almost like Machiavelli does. For instance, I think there's a line in The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith that says, it's not by the charity of the butcher or the baker that we get our meal, it's because they're pursuing their own self-interest. They want to make money, so they make bread and they provide, and that's where we get breakfast. <laughs> so there is no free lunch because someone else wants to be paid for it. But again, so it's this idea that as long as man is free, he will make correct, intelligent decisions and society will function as best it can. And if you look at the early foundations, if you look at, say, the right after the American founding, the, let's say, the Articles of Confederation, really limited government, the, uh, the trend in even the early you know, Constitution, when it was adopted, was a very hands-off government, very few, um, very few areas that it could kind of delve into. Now, that has changed over time. We've slowly accepted, in the United States at least, more uh, government intervention and, and, and greater, uh, greater involvement in everyday life. But that's where um, that we can kind of see where that comes from as we get into later in the lecture. And again, it differs, classical liberalism differs from what we would call modern liberalism in that modern liberalism and socialism that, that it's kind of born from believe that not only should we be free from government hampering our liberty, but we should be free from economic disadvantage, we should be free from poverty, that the economy is also a source of, um, of oppression, etc. And kind of the upshot is that the liberals, these classical liberals said a great deal of optimism in individuals. They said individuals can make intelligent decisions. As long as we're allowed to do that, everything will work out for the best. We're going to solve humanity's problems. And this first sort of iteration of this idea of progress. We talk about progress a lot nowadays. Are we making progress, etc.? Well, that really comes from the Enlightenment because they believe that progress was going to come about as long as people were free to make intelligent decisions and could educate themselves and throw off the shackles of superstitious religion and uh, petty governments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, there was a lot of optimism. This continued throughout the 19th century, and it's kind of the breakdown in this optimism uh, that we get socialism out. So again, really optimistic. Human beings are, you know, for all our flaws, we're pretty good. You know, we can make good decisions and uh, improve life. Okay. That's just underscoring that idea in, of inexorable human progress. It's always going to improve. And that civil society, if properly constructed, that is governments and any sort of civil society, if civilization is properly constructed and reasonably implemented according to natural laws, then it's going to be good for everyone. Uh, has anyone ever heard of, has anyone ever uh, studied Hegel or heard of Hegel, German philosopher? Hmm. No? Okay. Actually, we'll go into him a little later with uh, ba uh, Dr. Bagby. will talk about him. Anyway, um, he talked about a time when you know, we would advance to such a high point of human progress that we would basically cease to be, there would cease to be any progress. Uh, a guy named Francis Fukuyama called this the end of history. We, we get so happy and, and uh, <laughs> everything would be so good that basically history would end and there would be no more need for progress. So that's, it's kind of an odd thing, but when we think about progress and improvement. But this optimism that I'm talking about is not universal. So it's really important to remember what classical liberalism is based in and this idea, this optimistic idea of human progress. We're all going to get better. Oh, and that brings us to Rousseau, who, if the more I think about him, the more I realize he's probably the most influential philosopher um, if we think about what we're doing today and uh, a lot of the ideas that came after him. 
But Rousseau was somewhat, I call him the dissenter of the Enlightenment. He was an Enlightenment figure, but he was very different from Hobbes and Locke and Montesquieu and Voltaire and the others. They didn't like him, A. <laughs> they didn't really care for him. He didn't seem like a very nice guy, actually. He believed that civilization, essentially, governments, civil societies, actually didn't improve man. Here we go about, well, government's good for us. It'll preserve natural laws or natural rights. It can be good for us. He says, no, it can't. He believed that man was better, more noble, much happier in the state of nature. Again, he wrote a book called The um, Discourse on Inequality. And I have a few things that have uh, selections from it on the next slide. And he said, what's the origin of any, the inequality of man? And he set up, like Hobbes and Locke did, his own state of nature. So that's kind of a common motif where you just sit at your desk and start thinking, what was life like before, you know, before government and all that stuff? And so he came up with this idea that the state of nature is we were all kind of living individualistically, living in little huts, wearing animal skins, dressed with feathers and seashells, and that uh, we kind of got our, our meal. We lived under trees by the stream, and we got our meal from the acorns. and. Uh, it, it's really kind of weird. <laughs> he, uh, he had seen, um, he had taken uh, er, some accounts of how uh, Native Americans lived and got really, really uh, utopian with it and said, well, this was obviously the state of nature. Everyone was happy and no one went to war and never, everything was kind of incidental, et cetera, et cetera. The real problem started is when we got out of the state of nature. So unlike Hobbes and Locke, who they said the state of nature was a dangerous place and we needed governments and civil society to preserve our rights and to preserve our lives. Rousseau says, actually all that did was make us a the base, uh, or make us a base creature with, with uh, less to do, we were less strong. Back in the state of nature we were tough, we were resilient, but now we're, you know, after 2000 or 4,000 years of civilization, we're, you know, we're weak and we're petty and we're cruel to each other, et cetera. Hopefully this will help explain that. <clears throat> and again, this is his, from his Discourse on Inequality. You don't need to write any of this down. But uh, <laughs> He uh, argues basically that the source of inequality among human beings nowadays, he was writing for a contest, which he won, but the source of uh, inequality among human beings was way back in the day in the state of nature when one guy invented property. So property is the source of inequality. He says, the first man who having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found sim people simple enough to believe him was the real founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, and from how many horrors and, and, and misfortunes might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling in the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware of listening to this imposter. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to no Nobody. So again, it's all from this one guy who, back in the state of nature, came up with property. Now Rousseau wasn't really writing literally, <laughs> but he's again saying that it is the development of civil society, it's the development of a, of, if you will, a social contract, of governments, of civilization, that debases man, that causes wars, that, that uh, well, all these horrors and murders he mentions. And this is a profound influence on kind of how we think today, especially. I'll just hit this other one. The example of savages, and when he says that, he's talking about the Indians that they were, or the American Indians that they were beginning to encounter uh, in South America and North America. And he, uh, he had it on good authority that this is how they acted. But the examples of savages, most of whom have been found in this state, the state of nature, seems to prove that men were meant to remain in it. That is the real youth of the world, and that all subsequent advances, all subsequent advances, have been apparently so many steps toward the perfection of individual, but in reality towards the decrepitude of the species. So human beings of a species have suffered as a result of civilization. Now that's kind of a, that's a lot of words there. But when you consider his influence, by saying that civilization doesn't improve people, it makes life harder for them, it makes life difficult, it produces war and war. We get a lot, we have a lot of um, ideas that we think about. It's really powerful, that suggestion. 
because the French revolutionaries really followed Rousseau. We'll discuss that in a little bit. But especially if you look at Marx, Nietzsche, feminist theory, we studied women's studies, early socialists, all owe a great deal to Rousseau. Marx, who said that um, it is the means of production that make uh, that cause poverty. It's who owns the means of production. We'll get into that. Nietzsche wrote a book called Civilization and Its Discontents. And the really happy person was the one who could throw off the shackles of civilization and be his own man, who could throw away traditional morality and function as man should, uh, you know, with no fetters on him. Feminist theory. If you think, if any of you have taken women's studies and you've heard the term, uh, we live in a patriarchal society, that the history of society has been geared toward oppressing women. That is, again, that society is actually the evil here. And how the socialists did this, and you see the early socialists, the socialists like Marxists, or like Marx, saw that, well, the whole trend of history leads up to allowing major disadvantages between the rich and the poor to allow the major disadvantages for certain races, for certain religions, etc. And human beings are not at fault here. Individual human beings are not at fault for poverty. They're not at fault for being, for oppression or anything like that. It's all the society. It's all the civilization, etc. Again, that's really powerful. Because before then, it was the Enlightenment thinkers kind of had a big thing on individual action and responsibility. And if you think about something as quaint or something as, I would say, traditional, it's like the American dream. You can all get out there. We can all do it. We can all, you know, go from rags to riches, make money as long as we work hard and, and be good people. The socialists and the people who listen to Rousseau would say, nah, -uh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not like that at all. Uh, the American dream will it only advantage certain people and will disadvantage everyone else because that's how society works. Now, if, um, if we could get into like postmodern political theory, which I don't know if I'd want to inflict that on you, it's kind of kind of dense, but that's kind of how all this goes into. It's a it's a reply to civilization. It says civilization is not so good. So is this? I hope this has gotten this whole trend has gotten kind of clear. Early on, from Machiavelli, people saw the power of what a rational and realizable, or rational and reason society could do for people, could, you know, education could make people intelligent, we could live in a world without suffering as long as we, as long as we organize society correctly. But what Rousseau and the detractors say, they lose this optimism. And they say, no, society will always, or Governments will always disadvantage certain people, and we can't be as optimistic. So, again, this all kind of goes back to Rousseau, and I've gotten a little off on there, but I, again, when I think about him, and you can either like his work or not, like I said, it kind of reads a little flaky, but they really liked it back in the day, and it's been really important for us. Okay, the age of revolution that comes from this, and had I a little more time, I'd kind of do a broad based discussion of the differences between the American and the French revolutions and their political thought, but we'll just hit it really quickly. Um, all this sort of culminates when we talk about the Enlightenment. We'll get to we'll get back to it some a bit. But when we talk about the Enlightenment, it all kind of uh, culminates at the end of the 18th century with this age of revolution. And it's not just the American and the French Revolution. There were revolutions in nearly every country. Some of them failed, some of them not, all throughout Europe. And they were fueled in great deal by these Enlightenment thinkers. If you look at, and I just have a little thing here, well, the, whereas the American Revolution sought to establish sort of a small government and preserve individual liberty and preserve traditional English rights, the French didn't. They sought to break down society. The American Revolution, if you think about it, wasn't too much, it wasn't a radical revolution. It wasn't a revolution from the left. What did the founders want? If we think of taxation without representation, if we think don't quarter troops in our houses, if we think, you know, things like that, they wanted the right, they were Englishmen who wanted the rights of English citizens. They didn't want to be picked on. They wanted to be treated like other, treated like other Englishmen. That's kind of what the American colonists were after. They were pursuing kind of traditional rights. That's what they were arguing for in their revolution. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? <laughs> it's kind of hard to 
it's a kind of a big argument to, to make. But um, yeah, it wasn't a radical revolution. They weren't trying to break down their society. They were trying to preserve what they saw as their traditional way of life. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, all these people considered themselves as English citizen, English subjects rather, and traditional English gentlemen, and they kind of wanted to be treated as such, and they weren't. The French Revolution, on the other hand, oh, and the American Revolution, as we know, was probably was really encouraged by the thinking of Locke and Montesquieu and others, by these early Enlightenment thinkers. Now, the French Revolution, on the other hand, and you probably don't know the history of the French Revolution as much as you would the American, but the French Revolution, on the other hand, sought to break down society. It sought to tear away, it create something completely new. And especially later on, because early on it was just kind of, let's create a constitutional monarchy and kind of get the power of the church gone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But later on, they got more and more um, violent. And it was because they were in, in, uh, influenced by the thinking of Rousseau. Whereas Rousseau says, you know, by, uh, society and civilization is the cause of all our troubles, they wanted to tear down existing society and build up a new one in its place. They defaced churches, they cut off the heads of the statues of kings, they killed the Louis the Sixteenth, Marie Antoinette, and I think about 30,000 others in that one year in Paris during the Great Terror. There were some 600,000 people in all of France that died during this time, uh, plus about 25 years of nearly constant warfare from 1790 to 1815, all in the in the pursuit of tearing down the traditional society of Europe, the old regime, as it was called. And they called it a, a feudal system where there were you know, wealthy noblemen who had everything, and there were poor people who didn't have, every, who didn't have very much, but were still kind of had a, had a lot of uh, obligations to these noblemen. <coughs> um, let's see. The king still believed in his divine right to rule. But, okay. So they went to such lengths during the French Revolution that when they tore down, they took down the Catholic Church and they dedicated the Cathedral of Notre Dame to the, uh, oh, was the, the cult of the Supreme Being. And they invented this new religion <coughs> with they worshiped a reason. They didn't worship God, they worshiped a reason or the Supreme Creator. And they put on really weird costumes and they danced around trees. It's all really interesting. If you get to study the French Revolution, I'd do it. But it just goes to show you that influence of Rousseau. They wanted to tear down their society. And really, it took Napoleon to kind of calm everything down. But even he, you know, invaded the rest of Europe and tried to control it all. And he was a, he was a radical himself. So you can hopefully see the differences in those revolutions. I know I got through it really quickly. The American Revolution, a more conservative revolution, trying to retain and more traditional rights in the English tradition and the Lockean tradition, the French Revolution, to create new rights, to create a new society that doesn't allow poverty, that doesn't allow inequality. Okay. 19th century liberalism. Now, throughout much of the uh, 19th century, especially following you know, 1815 and the, uh, the final, the Napoleonic Wars, the French Revolutionary Wars, liberalism became ascendant again. There was a reaction in Europe to the radicalism of the revolution and to the ideas of Rousseau. And uh, early on, it was a time of a great deal of human progress. It was unfettered capitalism, as I say, throughout much of Europe very rapid industrialization, uh, and people saw this as a sign of progress. You know, we have, we're producing more and more, we're getting wealthier and wealthier, we're, we're building these huge factories, we're burning coal, we're inventing railroads, inventing the steam e engine. Look at how good we're doing. This is human progress. But a lot of people looked around and they saw all the poverty that was being created. You've all probably seen or read Oliver Twist, or David Copperfield, some of these other Dickensian novels that show little children working in factories and, and the, the poverty at this time, there was a great deal of friction because people were moving from the country and working for pennies a day in a factory and uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
And a lot of people said, you know what, this isn't progress. This is the debasement of human beings. You look at these poor sods that are going, living in, moving from the country, living in shacks and tenements, being dirty all the time, working and getting injured in factories. This isn't human progress. This is unacceptable. And so Rousseau's critique that society is harmful for human beings comes out again. And so where there had been this great deal of optimism, if human beings are allowed to pursue their own ideas, if human beings are allowed to just make individual decisions and get wealthy and live how they want to, uh, everything will be okay. People say no. People trying to get as rich as they can, trying to do what they can, results in massive poor, massive uh, amounts of poor, a whole lot of poverty, and not just poverty, but really dirty, dismal, and deathly poverty, because <laughs> uh, you didn't, you could, didn't want to die of inhaling the coal dust or get crushed in the gears of a machine, etc. It was all so completely different. And about this time, people really kind of got scared of where society would lead them. Because here in the early 18, or in the 1820s, I believe that Mary Shelley wrote the book Frankenstein about the man who, or about the doctor who creates artificial life. And that's kind of a parable for where are we going to go with science and are we going to be able to control it? Where are we going to go with uh, technology? So rather than seeing all this as progress, people again began to see, you know what, it's probably not uh, probably not progress. It's going to be uh, very difficult for all of us. So that's this, um, again, this trend, and I'll, I'll try and backtrack here. <clears throat> so we had the thinking of Rousseau that was uh, kind of a reaction against the optimism of the Enlightenment, and that's again rearing its head here. So hopefully you guys can answer. Are there any kind of questions over what we've done so far? I've got, I apologize, I've gone over so much stuff. We've gone through about, what, 400 years now <laughs> of political thought, and I've hit uh, a lot of different topics, and it's a lot of different complex stuff. I'm not going to ask very complex stuff on the on the test when I give Dr. Bagby my exam, but are there any kind of just general questions that you have about, uh, about this? Because this is the origin of socialism. I have a little more on 20th century socialism, but... Uh, Anything about classical liberalism or the American founding or anything like that? Good. Actually, going to get out of here probably quicker than I thought. All right. So, <clears throat> this brings up the what we would call socialism. Now, reading Sir Thomas More and Dr. Maggie is has continually said that that's you know utopian socialism. It's based on religion. St. Thomas More is a churchman who was trying to think of the, the rational, most ha happy way to live in accordance with, uh, with uh, you know, and it's utopian, it wasn't meant to really exist. It was just, just more of a mental exercise than, some, than anything. However, real socialism, what I'll call modern socialism, comes out of the dissatisfaction with liberalism. It comes out of saying, you know, we're seeing all this poverty. We want to do something about it. You just tell us, oh, let it ride. Everything's going to get better. You know, let the let the market work. We're hearing that nowadays. With the earlier with the stimulus package, we shouldn't bail anyone out. We should just let the market work. Let people, you know, fail if they're going to fail, and it'll all work out. That's kind of the traditional, classical liberal sense. And if I can get to that. <laughs> Liberal nowadays, as I said, means more leftist or uh, more um, on social ideas. You'd be free from any restraint in personal life. But also, you should have protection. Uh, your freedoms from poverty should be preserved as well. It's this idea that you can't be free unless you're economically secure to pursue certain things. And modern liberalism wants to guarantee a certain level of economic uh, standing a certain level of health. Classical liberalism didn't. Classical liberals are what we today <coughs> call conservatives. They were called liberals back then. Uh, classical conservatives would be what we call monarchists. <laughs> they, uh, they like the king. But um, and that's different because a lot of who we would consider early conservatives were also classical liberals, etc. So a kind of different play on words. So when we talk about remember if we talk about liberal and conservative 
and you're doing that in any sort of course that deals with history or political ideas or something, you have to remember kind of where it is. Because if I say, you know, you say someone's a liberal, then people go, no, nah, Rush Limbaugh says they're not a liberal or they're a liberal or something like that. You know, different meanings, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay. The origins of socialism, the, this type, uh, is again rooted in these same tenets of the Enlightenment. It says that just like the Enlightenment thinkers do, that human beings can be corrected, but it's not through freedom. It's not they can't be corrected through just being allowed to do anything they want, being allowed to let the the free market run. We have to create a different society. Remember, we said social ills, crime and poverty come from society. They come from civilization. And if we just change our society a little bit, if we put restrictions on certain people, if we go about it rationally and, and you know, more equitably, we can reduce poverty, we can reduce inequality, and make everyone happy, we can get rid of all these ugly slums and tenements and all these poor people being worked to death in factories, we can, we can make, give them happy lives, etc. <clears throat> This idea of the maximum of human freedom that the class of the liberals like was uh, was an, uh, antithetical to them. They believe too much freedom, especially in capitalism, creates disadvantages. This has to be corrected. Now, um, this is a. Uh, I just put this in there because I didn't really have anything else to put in. That's this was addressed from something called the First International. Because they, it was held in London in 1861. It was kind of the first meeting of socialists as a political movement. Now we know socialism is more than an ideology. It's actually an international political movement. It's not so big in, in America, but in Europe it has extremely deep roots. And uh, if you look at Europe's history, where they had a great uh, tradition of uh, capitalism, they had a tradition of uh, rapid industrialization, a lot of displacements in society, and then they didn't have universal suffrage until relatively late. You can see why why a lot of people said they need to stand up for the working poor. Early socialism always considered itself an international movement, too. And if you read Marx, you get this. You read in the Communist Manifesto, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. You have everything to gain. It's workers of the world. And this is in part because of how Marx considered capitalism, but everyone thought that if there was going to be a socialist revolution, it would have to be international. And this was kind of uh, how, it, how it worked, is that there were a series of sort of failed revolutions in 1826, and especially in 1848, uh, in France and in Austria and in uh, Germany and elsewhere, a whole bunch of revolutions that tried to achieve some socialist ends. And the first international, as we see here, the International Working Man's Association, is kind of a response. It's kind of a rebirth of this spirit of 1848. You often hear, if you study any European's history, that that's really what it is. See, the first international in the Paris Commune. 1861, the International Working Man's Association met in London. It was attended by trade union representatives, working man associations from all over Europe, and the goal was they wanted to develop an international strategy to improve the lives of workers. They favored an eight-hour work day. They wanted better working conditions. They wanted to get rid of uh, children working at night. They wanted to protect you know, women, kind of like what we would kind of consider today as traditional ideas, but, uh, you know, aside from these very practical ends in improving working conditions, they also did want to change their society. They wanted to put fetters on what capitalism can do. They wanted to nationalize land. They felt that landowners were too, um, didn't produce anything, but made a whole lot of money off of rents, and that they weren't anything to society. They wanted to nationalize land. They wanted to nationalize industry because they believe that the profit motive resulted in exploitation. That's one word we'll be hearing in Marx. The workers were exploited by a capitalist desire for profit. Okay. Marx was at this meeting in 1861 in uh, London, but uh, there was a great deal of conflict, especially between the Marxists and the anarchists which kind of come up later, and we'll discuss that, but kind of anarchy, as we know, no government at all. It all has its roots in the same sort of, the same sort of um, situation. The 
the kind of the dissatisfaction of the what we would call do nothing liberalism. I don't want to say do nothing, but you know, let it ride liberalism, laissez faire liberalism of the uh, of the 18th century or 19th century. The Paris Commune. I include this in here because you don't talk about it too much, but is kind of this first iteration of what we would call revolutionary socialism. Now, I have it on the next slide. I think I'll discuss that one first. Um, revolutionary versus evolutionary socialism. And Marx is in the revolutionary camp. Marx wanted to stage an international revolution of workers to seize control of money and assets from the bourgeoisie, from the capitalists, and give it to the hands of the workers. He wanted to set up a dictatorship of the proletariat, have them govern, and then they would ultimately realize true and equitable communism. And I'm getting a little ahead of you guys here because you're going to be reading about this but still. He wanted to, he thought that um, the revolution had, socialism had to be, you know, forced. It had to be because of um, the uh, capitalists, the wealthy, were too powerful, too entrenched to let it happen. Um, evolutionary socialism uh, was different. It wanted to kind of work within the process. It wanted to, um, it was eventually much, I would say, more successful uh, in the mainstream, but it wanted to kind of work within societies, democratic governments, mass politics were forming at this time, and so if, I point to this group called the Fabian Society, founded in London in 1844. That was an evolutionary socialist group. It takes its name from the general Fabius, who was known for being slow, the Roman general who held off Hannibal by not fighting him and kind of backing away and uh, worked. But uh, they wanted to be like that. They didn't want to enforce anything. And the, they're the, really the foundation for the British Labour Party, for a lot of social democratic parties in Europe. If you study the politics of Europe, you know that kind of their uh, left parties are, are a little more to the left than ours, because in the United States, oddly enough, we did not have a huge labor movement. And there's a big question as to why. People say it's because universal suffrage hit the United States a lot earlier than it did Europe. I don't know about that. But that's a good question for anyone interested in modern politics. Uh, again, the goal was to transform society inside rather than rip it down wholesale like the French revolutionaries wanted to do. <clears throat> the Paris Commune in 1871 was is just a sort of event that's kind of interesting to look at because it was a, a failed attempt at revolution, revolutionary socialism. Uh, following the Franco-Prussian War, a bunch of French social socialists seized power in Paris and set up the commune to govern. Now, the Parisian, if you know anything about French history, they have a, a wonderful tendency of every 30 years or so, at least in the 1800s, of going out, getting really pissed off at something, and uh, and uh, setting up barricades in the streets and everything like that. And usually it doesn't work out if you look at 1826 and 1848. But in 1871, you can see here they tore up the streets and used the stones to create barricades, and they put cannons through them, and you know, that's how they kind of did things. And they elected this uh, group of working men, uh, all art, you know, who would, who would govern on behalf of everyone else. It was kind of this dictatorship of the proletariat, the Marx says. They were eventually overthrown, but you can see that as early as 1871, this is, this is almost, what, 40 years before the Russian Revolution, before they're really the, we see as communism is really springing on the scene. But even this early, there was an idea that we want social, we want socialism, we want to transform society. They were eventually thrown out. Most of them, the communards, as they were called, were, were executed. But um, again, this is kind of an interesting startup to it. And it was, like I said, they. It, Socialism is supposed to be an international movement, but this was just a one isolated solitary incident, but it did have huge consequences because every other kind of group, socialist group, trade union, etc., wanted to support, was you know, really quick to give support to them, etc. So, okay. So we've talked about socialism as a, an international movement. And I mentioned Marx's Workers of the World Unite. 
However, when we think of kind of socialism today, we do think of, or in the 20th century, we do kind of think of, um, you know, different parties and, and et cetera in, in many different countries. But its most complete iterations has been in single nations, uh, Russia and China, et cetera. Now we can talk about, and we're going to talk about, I think, I'm going to talk about 20th century ideology, so I don't need to get into this too much. But uh, and Dr. Baby is going to talk about communism. But if you consider the the Russian Revolution in 1917, that was revolution in a single country, and Russia wasn't even really a, cap a capitalist economy at that point. It was still largely agrarian. You kind of wonder it wasn't the country suited. Marx always thought that co the communist revolution would take place in Germany. <laughs> because <laughs> Germany was more developed. But it always found socialism and socialist governments has always, has always found their strongest iterations, not internationally, but in nations like Russia and China, and then in the satellite states, the Soviet bloc, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this comes from a, an idea called socialism in one country. And it's actually uh, there, socialism in one country. Uh, which was sought up by a Soviet leader named Nikolai Bukharin. And this comes out of originally when the Russian Revolution took place and the communists took over in Russia, they were like, well, shouldn't we spend our time encouraging the, the international revolution? Let's go through the Ukraine and Poland and Germany and get everyone to become communists. Stalin said no. <laughs> he said, we need to make the Soviet Union strong. We need to concentrate on socialism in one country and make it strong so it can then encourage the revolution. So that's why we get kind of these totalitarian states devolving off of this, you know, grand sweeping international movement. You know, we sink to single states being the, the outcropping of socialism. Um, I think that's all I have today. Do you have... Uh, Kind of any questions about either the exam or what we're we're doing here? I kind of ended abruptly, but we're going to get into 20th century ideologies, and I don't want to play my hand too early or later. But I hope this helped. It gives you some idea of what we're doing. Oh, if anyone wants to check their uh, exams or has a question about it, I have uh, answer sheets up here. What is it? Pickle -a. Pickle -a? Yeah. And I could have just wrote like a circle thrown on here and then circled a different one from there.